Welcome to Trade Ideas. I'm Jake Merle, sitting down with Frank Capillary, Chief Market Technician at Incinet. Frank, it's great to have you back on the show. Thanks so much, Jake. So you were last here talking about the 10 steps for a sloppy market. As you noted last time, the market was stuck on step three. Can you please review what you actually mean by a sloppy market? And then can you also give us an update? Are we still stuck on step three? Sure. Well, the whole point of the exercise was to show that there's a, you can put a system in place to help remove emotion from the environment. And I think that's especially interesting and helpful as we extend it higher. Now, back then, we were only at 2,800 for the S&P 500. And, but we had reviewed that we were stuck on step three. And what those were was, again, step one was just to fail resistance. Step two was to have a downside of follow through. And three was to have a bearish pattern formed. Now, the most important thing we never got to was step number four, have that bearish target hit. And so up to that time, the end of February, we had a handful of bearish formations come and go at that point. And getting back to 2,800 is you no know, round number significance. Had that S&P had failed there numerous times over the last year or so. And it seemed like a really interesting spot to maybe take some profits and lay out shorts. But you know, we had to see a little bit more action on the downside for that to occur. And so actually, the S&P had a little bit of trouble over the next few weeks. And on March 22nd, fell about 1.9%. It looked like we were going to get that downside target hit. Did not, of course. And we had a really a substantial bear trap reversal. And from that point, there were then two other bearish patterns form and two other failed bearish patterns. So because of all that, the uptrend remains intact. And so the thing to remember about this is sometimes it's very difficult to see this, you know, real time. Everyone, not everyone's looking at 15, 30, 60 minute charts like I have luxury of doing. So I, what I did was, and toward the end of that last presentation, show this in oscillator form. So we take the, the 10 steps and actually make a, an oscillator from zero to 10. And we can see that on the chart that it's remained between, you know, zero and three. And we like to call that the tame zone. And it's just a fun way of saying that bearish patterns have not been successful. As long as that occurs, we have to remain on the right side of the trend. And so we have that you know, dotted line there to show what actually could, could occur. And if you go back to September and October of last year, that's exactly what happened, where you know, we tried to remain on the side of the trend until you know, it ended. And of course, it ended pretty violently at that point, but we never got back below three. And so it was able to, to stay then on, on the bearish side. And that's where we're at right now, still stuck on three. And as long as we're there, we're remaining on the side of the current prevailing trend, which is currently up. Okay, so as you mentioned, the Incinet Bear Oscillator has not changed since February. But has anything else caught your eye that investors should be worried about? Well, I think you have to look at, as the market rises, volatility obviously goes down. You know, we know the VIX is now below 13, so it's obvious. I don't think we have to review that. But I think it's important to take a look at what's caused that to happen. So we have to look at intraday and look at the intraday ranges, for instance, right? On a five-day rolling basis, we just hit 40 basis points over the last few days, which is really low. Compare that to February, we're at about 80 or 90 basis points. Take that all the way back to December, there's 350, 400 basis points a day. So it's really extreme. So if you look at that from you know, extremes, we're at the very end of the other side of the pendulum at that point. And so that could suggest that you know we're due for a pretty substantial reversal. But I will look back to what happened in you know April, through September of last year, you know, we're hovering around those points for, for a long time before anything mattered. And look through the entirety of 2017, you know, we had intraday ranges 30, 40 basis points, you know, all year before something occurred. So we have to look at this and realize why does this net bear oscillator continue to go zero to three? Because there's not been negative momentum strong enough to change any of this. So I think you have the intraday ranges that's going to change at some point. That's going to probably eventually have one of these bearish patterns hit. The other thing is that volume has been obviously shrinking. Yesterday on Monday, April 15th, was the lowest volume we've seen for a full day since the day after Labor Day 2018 in September. If you look at the five-day rolling average of volume, this is the lowest level we've had since September 20th last year. September 20th is, of course, important because that was the last all-time closing high that the S&P had. So all these things are together. We know we're at levels where typically things reverse. Timing that is much, very difficult and very challenging. Also frustrating because anytime you see a big you know, selling effort, whether it's because of the Fed or something else, you want to you know, say, that's it. And obviously we can't until we see more downside follow through and finally see a bearish pattern hit. So I'm relying on the instant bear oscillator for as long as it works. So Frank, what about under the surface? Have you seen any cracks in any key sectors or groups? I think it's an important point because it's very rare that you have everything moving in unison together at the same clip, making highs at the same time. But I would say that this period 
that had a lot of them working together. But there were two areas that I think that we continue to have to watch that gave some trouble over the last uh, few weeks. Number one being the financials, in particular the, the regional bank. So recall that the week of, of the, the Fed meeting in March, KRE ETF got crushed down 10%. Now, we knew all the stats, but that was the largest weekly decline for the KRE ETF for 10 years, going back to 2009. So worse than anything we saw in the volatility of 2018, worse than the correction in 2016, the correction in 2015, and the crazy volatility of 11, right? So when that was out there, the Fed having this now, you know, double stance and rates going down as much as they did, there was a real alarms going off. And, you know, this was going to, to set, you know, form a top of the S&P. That was, that was the big uh, talk about that time. And on March 22nd, at the end of that week, the S&P did fall 1.9%. But what happened the next week? Everything flipped. Right, so that was one. That was actually the chance to have a bearish pattern hit. Never happened. Carry was up um, a lot the next week. And the other thing was that Russell 2000 the small caps. Now they've done fine from the low on the way up. Actually, up a little bit more than the S and P 500. But keep in mind, it came down so much harder um, and topped out in August of last year before the S and P did. So you know, the big, I guess, you no know, gripe about that was it hadn't retraced as much. And because of Russell is 20% financials and 10% regional banks, they kind of do move together, especially when the, when the banks are doing it so bad. So same type of thing from say February, late February to late March, both the Russell and uh, Kerry were having trouble and both rallied. Now, I think the important part to look about, to talk about this is, you know, what are negative divergences? Why do they work sometimes and not the others? Well, in healthy markets, negative divergences just lead to rotation, right? Other areas doing well. In sloppy markets, negative divergences lead to a lot more pain from a much broader base, so the wage agencies get affected. Again, you can see that exactly what happened from August to September. So it's not something that we'll see happen immediately, but that's something obviously we're looking for. So far, the divergences have been temporary, they've been isolated, and they haven't mattered. At some point, that's going to change. So Frank, with all these things happening, bearish patterns never playing out, small ranges, low volume, and these bearish divergences are now reversing, how have investors' appetite towards risk changed at all? Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most important things to review. There's always an investor psychology cycle, and there's different versions of this, but one I've been looking at for a long time comes from this website called investorpostcards.com. As an aside, that website hasn't been updated in a number of years, but you can still find this, this cycle there. And so what I did was take those terms and overlay them upon the S&P 500 over the last year, which I think is really interesting. Now, this is a subjective exercise, so some people may disagree with where exactly we are, but I think it pretty much nails what's been going on, especially since the rollover. So just to review some of them over the last few months. Back in December, I think we can all agree that the S&P, as it was going down extremely hard, there was a lot of fear. Right at the beginning, especially the beginning of December, because actually December started out relatively okay. It had a few days higher, then everything fell apart. That quickly turned into panic, right? Panic seemed like the market was around, you know, falling apart two, three percent at a day, and any type of a bid was instantly wiped away. And so from that point, you know, we get down to Christmas Eve. I don't think anyone wanted to look at any screens at that point. I know I was there. It was very difficult to look at, and so fear turned to contempt. And I believe that contempt stuck with us as people received their annual quarterly statements for January, right? So then we had a pretty good pop off the low, say 10% or so into January, and people still weren't believing it. You know, there's a lot of doubt and suspicion there at that point, especially as the S&P approached 2,600. Now remember, that was a lower part of that range that we saw from October and November, and I think a lot of people were looking to lay some shorts out around that point, take some profits. Obviously, that didn't occur, we had a few days of a pause, and quickly got back up to 2,800. And as we just reviewed, at that point, it was still, it was probably even more of an interesting point for investors to look at. There was still not a lot of belief there. And so we can see the next portion of this is called caution. A lot of people talking about caution at that point. And they were right, you know, for about for a few weeks, you know, S&P pause, we reviewed how banks are doing relatively not that well, especially with Russell. But as we got through that 2800 and went to 2900, I believe that we went from um, caution to confidence. And at this point now we're getting close to or above 2900 or thereabouts. I believe we're getting to the point where confidence has turned to enthusiasm with the next um, the next term being uh, greed and conviction. And that's really where we're clearly at the end of uh, the run from last year. And so again, with this type of thing, we know we're at the, the other side of this, right? We're getting to a point where typically you see some sort of reversal, but the timing is the most difficult thing 
again, we look at 2017, even 2013, there was confidence, there was enthusiasm, there was conviction for many months up to that point. So again, we know where we are, we know the warning signs, you know, how, how close you know, we are to the highs and so forth and so on. We just have to see some real evidence of negative momentum come back to the picture before we can actually say, this is the top. So with all of this in mind and given all these factors, what's your trade idea for today? Well, we want to talk about the IHF healthcare providers. And if you ask me if that's a bullish pattern, it's absolutely not, right? So that's something that, you know, we have to identify. It also has a lot of headline news always with that sector. But I think we have to give it the benefit of the doubt. And the reasons are this. Number one, you know, it, it's really underperformed the S&P 500. We'll look at this from a chart and over the last two months, basically, from the end of February to recently. Now, remember, we can compare this to what the, um, the KRE looked like and the Russell 2000 looked like. They rallied and continue to rally. This one has had some instances of bouncing along the way, but each one produced a lower high. And then we saw what happened last week. So we, we have yet to see one of these rallies change the series of lower highs. So that's important. So we have to be concerned in, for the next bounce because the, the same thing may occur this time. But let's consider like how bad it was recently, right? And so if you look to the last week, the healthcare providers ETF was down over 6%. That's the seventh worst the climb we've seen on a weekly basis since its inception, 2006. That's pretty bad, right? And so if you can see from, we identified all of them on the chart there, and you can see that most of the time we did see a bounce. Sometimes a substantial bounce lasting for a few weeks, sometimes just a relief rally. Now, the thing that's concerning about this is that three of those happened since December. So anytime you see a cluster of weakness or a cluster of, of something that's happened against the prevailing trend, that could be an indication that maybe things are changing. So I think that's something we have to be concerned about that's a risk, even as the uh, IHF will rise that 10-year uptrend on the log scale. I think a bigger risk is that on the weekly chart, the IHF is forming or has formed this monster topping pattern, a head and shoulders pattern that really started at the beginning of 2018 and extended today. And we can see the implications of this. If you break below below there, you can have a lot of air beneath it and it can obviously um, get to much lower prices quickly. Now, the interesting part about that is that if you look at that pattern, this is precisely what so many investors and traders thought the S&P would look like at this point, right? You have these, this big top formation. We saw the big rally. A lot of people thought it would be a bear market rally that would, that would end, may say, 10, 15, 20% higher, and then roll over and form this other shoulder. And it hasn't, of course. Now, I guess the thing to be concerned about is, is this going to be the IHF the one that actually rolls over? And if that's the case, is the S&P finally going to notice? So do you think this bearish pattern will actually crack? Well, I think there's a real risk, but if we have to understand how we got to this point, right? how bad the damage has been. And so I think a good way to look at that initially is, is to look at the healthcare providers ETF versus the S&P 500. And now we can look at this chart that goes back to uh, 2008, and we can see what's happened over the last number of months compared to the S&P 500. That's a relative line on top in blue. It has just gotten hammered to the point where the weekly RSI of that relative line is now sitting at a level of 22. And you recall that 30 is oversold. So 22 is extreme no matter what we're measuring at this point. And so you look back over the last number of times this happened, not a lot to go by by any means, but you can see that typically when we get down to oversold levels on this relative basis, the IHF has had ability to rally, and versus the S&P 500 especially. And you consider how deeply oversold we are now, I think there's a good chance of that happening again. So is this something specific to just healthcare providers, or is this within all of healthcare? Well, you look at the performance breakdown for the year for the sectors, and healthcare is coming in last at the moment, you know, up about 4% through April uh, 15th versus, say, technology up 23% or almost 24%. So there's been a discrepancy at that point. And we can look at the pharmaceuticals as well, not even doing that well. But really, the biggest drag on the sector is healthcare providers. And we can see that on the next chart, looking at the performance since it topped out in November of 2018. Since that point, healthcare providers ETF is down about 20% versus the decline of 4% for the healthcare um, ETF itself. So it's, it's a huge difference compared even within its own sector. And so we can look at that even more so on a relative chart. So again, up top in blue is, is IHF providers ETF versus the healthcare XLV. And two things pop out of this. One, 
it took a lot to get this back down. And also consider the fact that the previous rally on a relative basis was substantial too. So that was extended to the upside. This just corrected it. And now it's corrected it to the point where the IHF versus the XLV is back down to uptrend line. So I think that's probably a good spot to maybe think about buying at least on a relative basis versus the XLV as well. Now that correction was pretty big. Again, I'm looking at the performance difference of the IHF versus the XLV, and it's about negative 16%. Now, if you go back to that same time frame in November, it's about 22 weeks. So if you look at a 22-week rate of change, the negative 16% performance difference is the biggest we've seen since 2009. So again, getting to the point where it's very extended versus the S&P and XLV together. The other part is just to look at the, the daily chart of the IHF itself, right? And we see that it poked through a very identifiable um, support line in red there. But it was able to hold that upward sloping trend line, which again, houses that head and shoulders pattern we just talked about. At the same time, even with all that pain that was that was going through the system versus you know the, the uh, XLV and S&P 500 itself, it's 14-day RSI, just again of its own price, never made oversold territory. I think that was interesting. That is slight positive divergence, which sometimes help helps a short-term bounce. So Frank, given all this information, how do you put it into an actionable trade idea? Right. So this is a mean reverting trade. The thing to, to look at too is that you have a pretty defined risk on the, on the downside. I'd be comfortable putting out a long, and you know we haven't had the ability to make higher highs yet. But I think with everything that's happened, it's probably set up better to do so now than otherwise. So we'll look to or toward the say the low 180s to mid 180s at this point as an objective. Now the thing with this is that we know that it's risky. We know that it's really underperforming everything. Again, we talked about the headline risk. Well, we have the, an uptrend with the S&P 500. And so that we've seen help other areas that have been diverging in the past. So it should help this one as well. If it doesn't, that's going to tell us a lot. That's going to tell us that there is a sector that is moving on its own in the opposite direction. And if it breaks down, I think it's going to cause a lot of people to notice. And I think that could maybe finally cause a bearish uh, formation's target to be hit. But we're still waiting for that to happen. Frank, that was great. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks a lot, Jake. So Frank suggests buying the healthcare provider's ETF, ticker symbol IHF, with the target price in the low to mid 180s. That was Frank Capillary, Chief Market Technician at Instanet. And for Real Vision, I'm Jake Merle. Mm -hmm.